I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Meet Roz Creasy. She's an award-winning garden and food writer, photographer, and landscape designer with a passion for beautiful vegetables and ecologically sensitive gardening. But more than that, to many, she's considered the guru of landscaping with food. She first popularized the concept over 30 years ago with the publication of Edible Landscaping and went on to write countless other books on the subject. Edible Landscaping immediately became a groundbreaking classic and is still in print today. It was one of the first books to move edibles out from the sheltered backyard and place them prominently in the front yard. In all of her work, Roz showcases her unique ability to incorporate food into beautifully designed outdoor environments. In fact, she takes the art of growing food to a whole new level. I never realized what a great mentor my dad was for gardening. Uh, it was very hands-off. And years later, it was cemented for me when I read a book called Growing Up Green. And they made a very big point that gardening is caught, not taught. This garden is an extension of me and I've been gardening here for 40 years. For the last 25 years, I take it out twice a year and put in a new theme because I'm in zone nine. And zone nine, I can have a summer garden and a winter garden. And because it's my photo studio and I want to show people all the many things they can do with edibles. My garden being in the front yard and having lots of edibles in it, it really does draw people in a lot more than if you had just some flowers or particularly a lawn. That doesn't draw people in at all. But once you have this yummy garden out front, it's just a magnet and the kids end up wanting to be part of it. We've just had more fun over the last 25 years and all the neighborhood children coming and going. And I think it's because it's edible plants in the, in, in the front yard. It has a lot more soul. Uh, and I really do think that this garden uh, has become the heart and soul of the street and the neighborhood. And it's just been a magical experience. I think it's a good idea to cover how to start all this. It, sometimes people get a little overwhelmed. I love to start people with herbs. I call herbs edible plants with training wheels. It's really just a great way to get started. It's, it's a no-brainer. So if you have a low-care shrub that's in a fairly sunny place, you take it out, just put in a whole bunch of herbs, the Mediterranean herbs, they're bulletproof. A container of strawberries is great if you have kids. It's wonderful. I love to use wine barrels. And I love them because, you know, the fruit can dangle over the side. And when it dangles, the birds can't get it, the slugs can't get it, and it's got more air circulation so they don't rot. And that's a real good way to start. And you want the new strawberries, they're wonderful, that are day neutral, and they will bear for six months. And the kids, I have 18-month-old children that come from next door, and they come running over straight to the strawberries. They get it. They get it real fast. So start with strawberries and start with some of the easier to grow edibles, depending on your climate. I would say, for instance, if you're in a warm climate, you've got pomegranates and persimmons and that sort of thing, no pests and diseases. If you're in a much colder climate, I would start with rhubarb, uh, horseradishes, absolute guaranteed. And I think some of the low bush blueberries work real well. And uh, it depends on your climate, but don't get in over your head because you can get overwhelmed um, and then you get discouraged. So it's better to start simply. 
When it comes to designing with edibles, there's probably going to be a time in the season where the plants don't look their best, or maybe it's the end of the season and you've done the harvest and you've taken the plants out. But you don't want your guest focusing on that empty space or that unattractive area. Instead, you want them to see the fullness of the garden, and there's a number of ways to do that no matter what the season, and it's by adding structure to the garden. Now, Roz does a great example of that with her covered walkways and pergolas, and she never misses an opportunity to grow something on it either. And for you, next season when you're thinking about adding those plants to your garden, think about the structure first. That way, even when you have some empty spaces, you're still going to have a lot of style in your garden too. When it comes to any thriving garden, one of the most important things you can do is put the right plant in the right place. And when it comes to edibles, that usually means full sun. But you also want to think about growth habit, like shorter plants in the front and taller plants in the back. Let's take these strawberries, for example. Now, these are a low-growing plant, and normally they'd be out front, but now they're in a container to add some vertical height. Check out this wild arugula. Now, this is good for the middle of the border. You've got this nice foliage here. It's a good peppery mix when it's added along with these nasturtiums, and I like the contrast in the foliage. And then you have one of my favorite plants of all time, the artichoke. Now, there's nothing like it other than its cousin, the cardoon, to give this good structure and height to the back of a border. And that's a fantastic look. Plus, this tastes pretty good as well. But if you're designing an edible landscape, don't be afraid to mix in the perennials and the annuals with the plants that you can eat because not only will you end up with a garden that's pretty to look at, but one that tastes pretty good too. From a master at growing edible plants in a stylish way, to the master at turning those edibles into gourmet meals, the world's most famous TV chef in recent years has discovered something else about food that's every bit as satisfying as cooking it. With a rapid ascent to international fame as television's galloping gourmet, Graham Care had it all. A wildly successful cooking show, fame, fortune, and a beautiful, talented, and savvy wife, Trina, whom he credits for much of his achievements. At the height of his career, the Galloping Gourmet was seen by 200 million people in 38 countries. That, along with sales of over 14 million copies of cookbooks and 28 trips around the globe, today he's considered the world's most famous cook. Yet these days, the Cares are far more content living outside of the spotlight and focusing their gifts and talents in a different way. Today, that focus is in building community, one neighbor at a time. In recent years, Graham has discovered a new passion for food that starts well before the kitchen. Starting with their small garden north of Seattle, in true care style, he's making the most of it and once again affirming the power of food to connect people and communities. You know, I love to have my garden able to be seen by people who are passing by. And I'll tell you why. Because I reckon in the suburbs, when people mow their grass, then the neighbor is more likely to mow their grass. But if it's all about mowing grass, it goes nowhere. Imagine an edible vegetable garden like mine, right outside the front on a drivable by, whoa, before you know where you are, you could have a whole neighborhood growing vegetables. But that doesn't happen. They're hidden behind somehow or in a little plot somewhere. No. Do it, blimp style. Well, I discovered a passion for gardening by really seven basil seeds. Now, I did it passionless. I did it as though I was going to my execution um, because I've never succeeded in doing anything which was gardening. I killed every plant I'd ever met. For seven mornings in a row, I went in to look at them with my heart sinking more each day, thinking, this is not for me, I, I can't do this. On the eighth morning, I became passionate because there were a little row of basil seed, and one of them had a, perched on the top of its, its leaf was a grain of soil. And it was, it was up underneath that sort of going, and I, I said to these basil, I said, good, and I clapped my hand and I said, I am talking to plants. <laughs> it was the most incredible moment um, and remains so for me. The most enjoyable thing about gardening is I know that I need to do something uh, more vigorous with my body than wield a pen or whisk an egg white. 
And I think that my body was designed to actually do the movements that are involved with forking things and raking things. I actually get in the garden and at about my weight, I'm running about 350 calories an hour by working that garden. But at the same time that I'm working it, I'm being rewarded by it because it looks great when I have finished. It tastes great when I have finished and I have more coming up than I can eat and that I can give away to people that I care a lot about. Wow. What kind of enjoyment can you get apart from being able to sing the Lord's Prayer in the Sistine Chapel? I, I'd like to do that, but I can't sing. I've been helped enormously by many people, but, but most of all with Scott Titus. He's a nurseryman and delivers me the starts that I have in the garden, none of which has ever failed. He's an amazing guy. He's just an autonomous. He just never stops talking or working. He's just great. It was important to me that this wasn't just about me and just about my garden. I wanted to go beyond the garden. Um, and, um, and we have a very small church that we attend and so we we were wanting to know how to make a difference in our community, do something that people would be more ho hopeful and helpful um, in some way. And it came right down to eat more plants, grow more plants, do it with your neighbors. First of all, I'm completely convinced that when we grow food for ourselves in the garden, that we are doing ourselves an enormous amount of good. There's no question of doubt about it that if we can eat from 9 to 11 servings fruit and vegetables a day, we are absolutely operating in the way which we were designed to. But beyond that, we're designed to love and care for each other as neighbors and communities of people. And um, this gives me a basket of stuff that I can take to a neighbor and give to them. It's tremendously exciting to know that there's more for me coming out of the ground than I can possibly consume. That's what delights me so much. Quick, quick, quick um, story. I took my very first tomato and basil next door to my next door neighbor handed it to her, said, this is the first one I've ever grown, but I'd like you to have it. I shouldn't have said that. Um, and she said, oh, thanks. And I said, is there something wrong? I mean, she should have jumped up and down with joy. And she said, I just found out my mum is dying. So we put a tomato on the ground, put her arms around her, Trina came over, and we cried with those that cry, and we became neighbours, all for one tomato and a piece of basil. Come on, doesn't get much better than that. Starting with their small garden north of Seattle, in true care style, he's making the most of it and once again, affirming the power of food to connect people and communities. All right, guys, enough of this chit chat. Here we go. I'm ready to work, Harry. Hey, there he hey. Is. Very good. Look, you see the split cabbages there? Yeah. The yeah. ones with that sort of <laughs> look a bit like you, actually. Um, if, if you could pull those up and there's some rather nasty beasts underneath. I'll take care of them, no problem. <laughs> you guys are going to help, right? Okay. Kind okay. of. Yeah. We'll help from afar. Good I luck with that, Joe. Okay, I got it, Graham. Guys, it's Graham Carey. He's inviting me in to do some cooking. I used to watch this guy as a kid. You don't understand. Somebody pinch me. Pinch me for goodness sakes. The last 20 years, he's switched his ways from like butter and cream and classic French cooking to something refreshing and new. And that's what he's going to show me right now. Now this is exactly what I'm talking about. I don't see any cream here, Graham. No, no cream. Okay. No butter. So, well, <laughs> you're, you're going to make something really uh, creamy as far as the mouthfeel. Can, yes. you, can you walk me through exactly what you're making and then I, I would love to assist you. You would. It's, a, it's actually a dream come true. I mean, it's... Yeah, you know that I have never in my entire career had an assistant. In, in 1,800 television shows the first time. I couldn't be more thrilled. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> All right. Let's see how it goes. Um, let me show you what's going on here. Um, okay. First of all, I've taken some sweet potato and simply cooked that so that it's extremely tender. Okay, now this is a fat-free milk, okay. and, and, and so that has now been poaching in that milk. It now needs to hit there. Okay, great. 
this is the important thing about this one. When this combination hits together and you get the plant cellulose mixing with those milk proteins, no fat, what happens, put it all in, okay. the whole lot, everything, oh, that. just shake it, just go for it, buddy. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Chris. That's it. Ah, ah. <laughs> That's what we need. Um, so when, when this is combined together, it'll turn into something called velvet. That's why I call it a velvet sauce. And that's all you have to do it. Okay. Explain how you do that. Okay, great. So one of the things that I see people uh, having troubles with in their own homes when it comes to making hot soups and throwing in a blender, if you were to fill this thing up near the top and then turn it on, the heat expands and it just, you guys know what I'm talking about, just spurts all over the place and you're spending your afternoon, instead of enjoying the soup, cleaning up your kitchen. No one wants that. So you would start with just a little bit and luckily uh, I think it's just two servings here with yeah. Graham and myself. Fantastic. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to uh, fill it more than a quarter of the way. If hypothetically we had a lot of soup, I would just fill with maybe a cup of soup in there, turn it on, and then as that blends, you can actually take the lid off and then add more soup. What you don't want to do is just jam your hands on there. It builds up pressure and it spurts all over the place. So I'm going to be really gentle, leave the lid off a little bit, pulse it just a touch to get it going, and then you can go full steam. Okay? Let's watch. There we go. Good. Good. That's good. Good? Okay. okay. Switch it off for a moment. Now. This is going to seem like a waste of electricity, but believe me, you can do this for a minute, you can do it for two, and you'll get a nice creamy mix. If you do it for three plus, almost up to four, you will get velvet starting, and you'll see a gloss coming up on the outside, and that's what we're aiming for. Okay, right, that's on the four minutes. Ah. Such a relief. <laughs> so now, like this? let's have a look. Yes, see see how glossy that looks from the top? Yeah. That wouldn't have been glossy, it'd been matte before then. Okay. So that's that's how you know it. For, now that's nice and hot now, we just keep it on one side. Okay. This pan is heated up, so let's make the omelet using an egg substitute. And I use the one with a southwestern style because I really believe I want two quarter cups, I want half a cup okay. in that mix all together. So I've got half a cup of egg substitute. And the reason why I use that is because they put horseradish, this is a horseradish leaf, but they put horseradish root into it, as well as peppers and tomatoes, okay. uh, red and green peppers. Okay. And that gives you a flavor balance. It, it, they've taken the yolk out, but they put something in. Okay. And that's, I always feel that you've got to do that. Yeah, I agree. And just plain egg substitute doesn't really cut it for me. Okay. All right. So now we've got um, a heated pan on there and well, it might look like butter, but this is wouldn't believe it isn't butter. Okay. That's about as close to butter as I've been, ever been able to get. And it seems to work well. All right. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that pan is at the right temperature for eggs to coagulate. And you know the answer to this one, but it has to smell like hazelnuts. And strange enough, even though it's a, a, a butter substitute, yeah. it does actually come up with that characteristic. And it's beginning now to get that just faint, light brown, golden look to it. Okay. At that point, I want to add the eggs. And then to move that, um, there are many ways that people make omelets, but this is the most important thing, to keep the eggs always moving over the base. And the reason for that is that you're allowing it all to coagulate okay. in an even way. Now, here, uh, just to spread that over the top to be able to get those so that they're nicely cooked. Okay. This is a green garbanzo bean, all right? That little fella there. And have you ever met a green garbanzo bean yet? You know, at the farmer's market, I have. Aha! Uh -huh. And they're nice and soft. Yes. They're fresh they, ones. They, they are. This, this is a snap frozen one, and this is from last season. And uh, I'm actually growing that. They're, they're right outside the greenhouse there. Okay. That's what's Was I not up. supposed to eat that? I just ate that. Okay. Okay. Well, you are one of the <laughs> rare ones who have actually tasted this. It's not the average person who has ever seen that. So we're letting this 
Yes, it's up six now. I'm going to put a little shaved Parmesan cheese okay. over the top. Not a lot because I actually come down to only two grams of saturated fat with this whole dish. All right. So let's just um, uh, run a little um, bit under the top. So that's going nicely underneath. Now let me show you something here. This is, this is Bavers, you know what the French call Bavers, which is, um, th this is still runny okay. over the top. And I want that runniness. Most people cook the eggs because they're concerned about, you know, bacteria. Right. Now you see that this one here is actually a hundred and let's see, what have we got there? We're getting up there. I think it's... It's 173. Yep. 173. 145, it's done. Okay. All right, okay. so we have no problem there. So we lift that back just on that side, and then if it should stick, as this one is showing signs of doing, then you just take a little bit more of the wooden, believe it isn't butter, drop that behind the level of the omelet, just feed it and, under. and take one of these fle flexible spatulas like this and just pass it underneath. And we'll just shake that out onto the pan like okay. that. Okay. Here, let us have the sauce. Okay. Now this is, this is something which you must, I'm, I'm sure, have never seen. You know, to actually coat an omelette with a sauce. I like to be able to allow a certain amount of that omelette to be... I could, I could have bet you would have known we'd finished. Just looking for some pruner. <laughs> okay. What do we have? Oh, well, so we're, just, we're just about to <laughs> do, do some decoration on the top of this. This is, um, this, this little omelette is an omelette which only has two grams of saturated fat on it. And I'm just taking some Aristotle basil. There we have it. One fourth. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> exactly. I am holding on you to like it. like that? <laughs> All right. Go. Um, you. So you can go from that side and this one. Um, what I, what I'm after you, what I want you to do is I want you to eat that. It's a bit hot. Um, smooth, yeah. mm. very smooth. Yeah. Do you see the texture that you get from that? You really wouldn't know that it was so low down in fat, would you? Not at all. It's no. very rich. Actually, it's dish. like the yeah. mouthfeel, not only the mouthfeel, but the gloss looks like he had whisked butter into it. And he didn't at all. You saw it. We just emulsified it using your uh, your your blender. We'll put this website. On, we'll put the uh, we'll put the website on my on my <laughs> on my address. I've got his website on my omelet, which is a great place to be. <laughs> it was so good. I just stopped thinking. <laughs> what do you mean you started? No. <laughs> Okay, we're through with Graham now. If you'd like more information, Hello. check out our website. <laughs> the address is the same as our name, growingagreenerworld.com, and we will have the recipe for this delicious omelet right there. Well, we hope you've enjoyed as much as we have spending time with Roz and Graham today to see just how beautiful an edible garden can be no matter where it is in the landscape. And then using that garden to build community. And if you'd like to learn more about edible landscapes, you can find that under the show notes for this episode on our website. Oh, and you can see all kinds of things on the website. Past episodes, my cooking demos, and the recipes. And the address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Nathan Lyon. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. <laughs> no, no, no pressure, Graham. It's a big moment for me. It's gonna be a lot of outtakes in this one. Wrap your bag. I'm fine. <laughs> Hello.